Hi, I'm Brian Donovan from the New Hampshire Knights of Columbus. Welcome to Knights of Columbus Discuss. I'm with uh, Roy Schumann, and Roy, thanks a lot for joining us today. My pleasure. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things uh, uh, that we see in your YouTube videos and some of the other videos. Uh, one of the things that we do quite often is use uh, videos, kind of tie them into our discussions. And before we do that, um, you know, uh, Roy, one of the... Um, one of the topics that uh, obviously you focus on, uh, Salvation from the Jews, is the book that you wrote and, and the YouTube channel. The connection between Judaism and Catholicism is something that was really important to you and, and it's kind of one of the things that you focus on. How did you come to that and, and uh, from your background, how did you, um, how was that, you know, part of your story basically? Um, well, first of all, I am, I am born and raised Jewish, actually quite religiously Jewish. And I had a series of experiences that led me enthusiastically into the Catholic Church. And um, when I became a Catholic, and I'll go back maybe and mention that a little bit because it's really fun stuff. But when I became a Catholic, I mean, it was obvious to me that um, if the Catholic faith is true, and obviously it is true, then the Catholic Church is nothing other than the continuation of Judaism after the coming of the G uh, Jewish Messiah. I mean, if, if Jesus was who he's supposed to be, he was the long-awaited, promised Messiah of Judaism. And he, when he came, transformed um, the pre-Messianic uh, form of the religion, let's say, into the post-Messianic form. And so um, the Catholic Church is essentially post-Messianic Judaism. Judaism is essentially pre-Messianic Catholicism. Um, there, were, there are a lot of aspects of that transformation which are very interesting to me. And, of course, I was kind of on fire, as, as new converts frequently are. And I was puzzled that that isn't the way every cradle Catholic saw it. I mean, they tended to think, I mean, they would come up to me and they would say, um, you know, find out I was a Jewish convert. They'd say, oh, wonderful, welcome to our church. And I would think they had it backwards. It should be me saying to them, welcome to my church, because... It was Judaism, and we, well, we brought in the Gentiles, and it became the Catholic Church. So in my frustration that that wasn't the way that uh, the whole Catholic world understood things, I wrote my first book, Salvation is from the Jews, The Role of Judaism in Salvation History from Abraham to the Second Coming, um, basically just laying out exactly that, the role of Judaism in salvation history from Abraham to the Second Coming, to show the continuity um, and the progression from Judaism to the Catholic Church, and um, so that's that's how I uh, that's how this came about. Uh, would you like me to? Yeah, why don't you do that? I mean, the, the the first clip that we have is kind of a real short two or three minute clip from your witness testimony that you did in um, Prescott, Arizona, I believe. So what we do as a uh, that will that will run in its entirety the week after this mm -hmm. program, so the viewers will be able to see all of that. But because that kind of lays the foundation for the rest mm -hmm. of our discussion, if you want to kind of elaborate a little sure. bit, sure. Well, I, as I said, I was born and raised Jewish. My my parents were both uh, German Jewish Holocaust refugees. They were both born and raised in Germany, and uh, my father came over to the United States um, just early in Hitler's reign, so he was able to leave. My mother was less fortunate, and she was actually arrested by the Gestapo and put on a train to a concentration camp, but escaped and eventually made it to the United States. And my whole world was Jewish growing up, and um, I was quite devout and quite observant. Uh, then I went to university, MIT, and uh, lost my faith at MIT, and I think later we'll have an opportunity to talk about um, how that happened under the pseudoscientific worldview of, that MIT is kind of the icon of that science has all the answers and religion is just kind of a medieval superstition that man made up until he had science to give him the real answers. Nothing could be further from the truth, but that's another topic. So I lost my faith. Um, I uh, went on to Harvard Business School. I did well enough there to be invited to join the faculty. So I found myself on the faculty of Harvard Business School at the age of 29 as a newly minted marketing professor. And um, that's when the bottom fell out of my world because here I was more successful already in a worldly sense than I ever expected, but there was still no meaning or purpose to life. 
But at that point, there was nothing more I could imagine would give meaning or purpose to life because it's not like I was going to be more successful than being a 29-year-old Harvard Business School professor. So I fell into a kind of despair, and I was walking in nature early one morning when I received the most spectacular grace of my life, that the veil between earth and heaven disappeared. And I found myself in the presence of God, very knowingly in the presence of God, seeing my life as I would see it after death in the presence of God, looking back over my life, seeing everything I would be happy about, everything I would wish I had done differently. And I, I, knew, I knew nothing of Christianity at this time. I had never opened a New Testament, but in this experience, in this uh, intellectual vision, mystical experience, I saw most of the truths of the faith. I saw that everything we did had a moral content that was observed and recorded for all eternity. I saw that we would be rewarded for all eternity for every opportunity we took advantage of to do something of value in the eyes of heaven. And um, every opportunity we let slip would be a lost opportunity that in some sense would diminish our eternity for all eternity. Um, I saw that everything that ever happened to me had been the most perfect thing that could have been arranged coming from the hands of an all-knowing, all-loving God. Not only including those things that had caused the most suffering, but especially those things that had caused the most suffering at the time. Um, I saw that um, actually the most astounding or the most moving aspect of this experience was just coming into the knowledge and very intimate awareness that every moment of my existence God, the God who had not only created the universe, but actually created existence itself, as well as time and space, had been watching over me, controlling everything that happened to me, caring about me, every moment as though I was the only creature I had ever created. And that not only had he controlled everything that happened to me, but he cared about how I felt at every moment, and in a very real sense was made happy by everything that made me happy and saddened by everything that made me sad. And, and to realize this um, incredible, intimate uh, attention from the God who the picture that emerges from Judaism is of God being much more distant, um, was just absolutely overwhelming. And I knew that uh, the meaning and purpose of my life was to worship and serve my Lord and Master and God who was revealing himself to me. But what I didn't know was what his name was and what religion to follow. So I prayed at the time on the spot, let me know your name so I know what religion to follow, to worship and serve you properly. I don't mind if you're Buddha and I have to become Buddhist. I don't mind if you're Krishna and I have to become Hindu. I don't mind if you're Apollo and I have to become a Roman pagan, as long as you're not Christ and I have to become Christian. I really prayed that. So he didn't reveal his name to me. But after that experience, um, every night before going to sleep, I would say a short prayer I had made up to know the name of my Lord and God and Master who had revealed himself to me. And a year later, to the day, I went to sleep, and I thought I was woken by hand gently on my shoulder and brought to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. And I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, when I found myself in her presence, all I wanted to do was throw myself on my knees and somehow honor her appropriately. In fact, my first thought was, I, I wish I at least knew the Hail Mary, but I didn't. But the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. So I asked her about four, probably about five or six questions, which she graciously answered. And uh, then she said she had something she wanted to tell me. And then she spoke to me for about another 15 or 20 minutes. And then the audience was over, and I went back to sleep. Now, I have to say, I know this was not, this was, I don't know what the right term is, an out of, I know this wasn't an in the body experience. In other words, I know that if there was a camera in the room, it would have shown me asleep in bed. But um, I thought I was awake, and my memory represents it as awake. So I'm describing it as though I were awake. I mean, I was interiorly awake, but I know my body was asleep in bed. Anyway, after she spoke to me for those other 15 or 20 minutes, I went back to sleep. Next morning when I woke up, I knew it had been Christ in that first experience. I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. I knew her role as the conduit of all graces that flow from the divinity into humanity. I knew that from that experience. Uh, I didn't know the difference between a Christian and a 
uh, between a Protestant and a Catholic, but I knew I wanted to be as much and fully a Christian as possible. So um, all I could really do was open a local phone book and started going to a Protestant church. But since I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was, um, it didn't take me too long to find my way to the Catholic Church. So that's basically the backstory. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> as, as you were describing that, and, you, and the video kind of goes into that in a little bit more detail, but uh, your reaction, I mean, you were saying a prayer, I don't mind if I'd you know, be Hindu or whatever, but not Christianity. You know, where was that coming from? I mean, is, is that something that you, you felt, you yourself felt, or is that part of Judaism as a child growing up that, you know, just kind of manifested itself? Um, I definitely felt that. Um, and I think many, it's a little less now because we're now another generation away from the Holocaust. I think that that anti, well, I wouldn't say anti-Christianity, but that aversion to the thought of, of being Christian comes from a couple of different places. One is, as I mentioned, my parents were literally Holocaust refugees. And things have changed now, but we're, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, there was still a, a fairly strong sense in the Jewish community that the Holocaust was an expression of, uh, in a way, a, an expression of Christianity. Because you don't have to start with the Holocaust, you can go back, but um, the, the history of the Jews in Europe was one of persecution and uh, periodically being expelled from countries. They were expelled from France, they were expelled from Great Britain, they were expelled from uh, Spain, uh, and, and continually forced to wander and try to find some place where they could live. They, there were progr called pogroms, but um, basically mass riot slayings mm -hmm. of Jews mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of Europe, especially in, in Poland and Russia and the Ukraine and so forth. And so there, there was this long history of, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, it wasn't theologically flowing out of Christianity, but it was coming from Christians in the name of Christianity. Because, for instance, uh, Holy Week was, uh, Jews had to stay indoors in Eastern Europe during Holy Week because, you know, mobs coming from the church where they heard the passion narrative, you know, and what the Jews had done to Jesus were in distinct danger of trying to take it out on you know, a Jew walking down the street. So there really was a, a, some rationale for an association between Christianity and persecution of the Jews. And then you had the Holocaust. And um, this is a, a topic for another show, but Hitler actually, when he first entered politics, presented himself as the defender of the Catholic Church against atheist Jewish Bolshevism, because Germany was trying to resist basically a communist takeover. And uh, Hitler presented himself as the defense of Christendom against this threat from the East of communism. So, you know, it's not, not too unreasonable for the Jewish community to have really felt like Christianity was the enemy, that Christianity was the persecutor, and so forth. Uh, so that's, I think, most of where that, that came from. Um, it's also true that since Christ, actually, and the coming of Christianity, um, the, from a Jewish perspective, Christianity was the greatest threat to Judaism because, because when a Jew stopped being a Jew, he stopped being a Jew to become a Christian. So, you know, the Jewish community was being uh, eroded by conversion to Christianity. So there was always, that started, of course, I mean, you see it all in the book of Acts. I mean, it started in the very beginning. Of, of course, Jesus was Jewish. The mm -hmm. apostles were Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, the, first, the first entrance in the church were Jewish, and it never stopped. So there's, there's a sense that if uh, Judaism is to be preserved, it has to have this bulwark against Christianity. So there are a lot of things that flowed into that. You know, I've heard you say in one of your other videos that it was almost like there had to be a little bit of a resistance between Judaism and Christianity in the beginning because... Christianity could not have been seen as a as a Jewish sect, basically, or only for Jews. Absolutely, and uh, absolutely, yeah. that's really interesting to me. Um, and uh, I'm going to inadvertently give a plug because basically all of your questions are excellent, and I'd love to talk for an hour answering each question. So uh, fortunately, I do have a YouTube channel and a lot of videos of me on YouTube where 
I have a lot more time where I, I could give a 40 minute answer to that question, but I'll try to give like a, a, a three minute answer, which is uh, you see already in the book of Acts, the very first crisis in the church, the um, first ecumenical council where, where all of the apostles got together to decide this burning issue which was in danger of threatening the emerging church. It's the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, it was about 51 AD. What was the emergency? What was the crisis? The crisis was, are we allowed to let Gentiles into the church? Or is the church only for Jews? Does it only have, I mean, because as I said, I mean, Jesus was Jewish. The apostles were Jewish. Um, it looked like a sect of Judaism when it first emerged. And it was a sect of Judaism mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes when it emerged. And so the question was, um, is it supposed to be a sect of Judaism or is it supposed to be for everyone on an equal basis? And of course, the Holy Spirit didn't take long in, in, in directing the church in, in, that, in that direction. Right. You know, uh, one of the other things that kind of along those lines is that you talk a little bit about I'm not sure what video it is, and it might be the, um, the one when you're talking about confirmation of Jesus in the Talmud, that the, the significance of the destruction of the temple as far as the break between Christianity and, and Judaism. And one of the things that, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, this is a question that a lot of Catholics, a lot of non-Catholics ask, and maybe uh, in the Jewish community as well, you know, Judaism, Temple Judaism had um, priests and so forth, they don't, so Judaism right now, rabbinic Judaism doesn't have that. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that, sure. the differences between that. And I, that plays a role in the understanding of the fit with Catholicism I, as well. I would actually almost, uh, I more naturally look at it from the opposite direction because basically what happened was um, we know, we know that when, um, you can look at it different ways. When Jesus celebrated the Last Supper, when Jesus died on the cross, the sac that was the end of sacramental Judaism, uh, right? The, the veil in the temple was rent mm -hmm. in two. Mm -hmm. The dead rose from the graves. Uh, anyone who saw Mel Gibson's, you know, The Passion of the Christ mm -hmm. saw that scene. And that, that was, a, and, but that scene is in, in, the, in the Gospels, a very dramatic picture of the fact that the role of the temple ceased, the, the role of um, animal sacrifice, the, basically the, Te um, Old Testament Judaism, uh, sacrifice-oriented Judaism, sacramental Judaism, ended with the crucifixion. That's why the temple w was in ruins and stuff. Was is a picture of that. And the letter to the Hebrews, by the way, uh, in the in the New Testament, is in some sense all about that. That that the um, uh, you can call it temple Judaism. Temple Judaism was a picture of what was really to come and the animal sacrifices were a picture of the true lamb of god who'd be mm -hmm. sacrificed for the remission of sins and so forth so in fact um, it isn't that the destruction of the temple affected the relationship between judaism and christianity as much as that the transition between judaism from judaism into christianity resulted in the destruction of the temple. It had a result in the destruction of the temple. The, the, the meaningfulness of temple sacrifice ended in 33 AD with the crucifixion. Um, the physical destruction of the temple took about another 35 to 40 years before um, the Romans, there was a Jewish revolt and then the Romans uh, suppressed that revolt uh, very heavy handedly and the, the temple literally, there was no two, one stone left on top of the other. So uh, at that point, all of the Judaism we know from the Old Testament, all of the Judaism we know from you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and offering lambs and goats and sacrifice and a ritual priesthood and the purification and all the purity laws that required the temple for purification and so forth, that just went away because um, the temple was destroyed and the Jews were exiled from Jerusalem under pain of death. And it took a few years, but pretty soon the Jewish community realized they would never get the temple again. They would never get, or not in the foreseeable future, they would never get Jerusalem again. What are we going to do? Is that the end of Judaism? Because it was the end of the old Judaism. There, there was no way to continue. 
So then the rabbis got together, it was supposedly about 130 AD, you know, oy vey, what are we going to do now? And they came up with what has been called rabbinic Judaism, where they decided that the temple sacrifices could be substituted for with prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And they developed this codification of this new Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, um, to enable Judaism to continue in the absence of animal sacrifice. One could argue that that rabbinic Judaism is really a man-made religion. Uh, it's not based in the Old Testament. I mean, the Old Testament doesn't say anything about that stuff. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament says quite the opposite, that you need the animal sacrifice and stuff. So in any case, uh, there was uh, around that time um, a total redefinition of Judaism to adapt to the fact that the temple didn't exist and therefore animal sacrifice didn't, it couldn't exist. Now, um, you mentioned the Talmud. Is that the, the Jewish document that kind of recorded the history of that period? Or maybe you can explain to us, you know, what is the Talmud as far as, you know, uh, uh, Jewish scripture? No, sure. Um, you could think of the Talmud as, as, in some sense, the catechism of the Jewish church. In other words, um, in, in Catholicism, you have the scriptures, which are like the core, and then you have the catechism, which kinds of explains the scriptures, interprets the scriptures, makes the scriptures more accessible, makes it very plain language, what you're supposed to draw from the scriptures and so forth. Um, so in a way it's a, um, you have this kernel of divinely revealed direct revelation, and then you have under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, explanation of that. And you have the same thing in Judaism essentially. You have, you have the Old Testament, which is the hardcore divine revelation, and then you have the Talmud, which is the rabbis, from a Jewish perspective, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, under the guidance of inspiration, explaining it, uh, explaining how you're supposed to do the things that are asked for, and, and providing like a gloss and interpretation. And because of the structure of the Talmud, there's also a lot of historical discussion in there, because, because the Catechism just is like a rule book in a sense, but the Talmud is structured by saying, you know, Rabbi so-and-so says this means this, but Rabbi so-and-so says no, this means that. So then they have a long discussion and decide where the truth lies. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more uh, historical context embedded in the Talmud. So it's kind of a mixture of exegesis of the Old Testament um, and uh, explanation of how you're supposed to follow the laws and also a historical context. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Roy, we've been talking and I, we have some clips I really didn't make the segue to it. Let's take a minute right now and look at the Talmud, the, um, the, one of the clips. And I just want to mention your YouTube channel, Salvation is from the Jews. You've got 40 or 50 hours of great video there. So anybody that is watching this, go check out the YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube, just type in uh, Salvation is from the Jews or Roy Schumann. You'll be able to find those. Uh, that's S-C-H-O-E-M-A-N. Okay. <laughs> And the video that we're going to um, take a look at is from the um, confirmation of um, Jesus in the Talmud. So that's the document that we're talking about right now. You kind of talk a little bit more about that. And then when we come back, there was a specific question that you raised in that that I think really kind of points at Jesus. So we're going to discuss, discuss that when we come back. Let me um, make my first digression of the afternoon then and say uh, something about the, just the ending of the Jewish ritual sacrifice. Um, there, somebody asked me last, uh, yesterday, whether there was still a Jewish priesthood, what happened to the Jewish uh, sacramental priesthood. And there are a lot of answers to that, uh, depending on how you look at it, but one answer is there couldn't be a genuine sacramental priesthood after the destruction of the temple, because for the priest to purify himself, he needed the animal sacrifice and he needed the uh, ashes of the red heifer sacrifice in the temple to become ritually pure enough to offer sacrifice. So when the temple was destroyed, there could no longer be a genuine uh, ritual uh, Jewish priesthood. And, um, people with the last name Kohen or Cohen or Khan or Kuhn uh, trace themselves to the priestly um, tribe. And that's what Kohen is, Hebrew for priest. And so people with that last name consider themselves descendants of the priestly tribe. 
And there's a little bit of ritual significance to that, but it, it obviously isn't the um, sacrificial priesthood. Now, there's another reason this is relevant, which is that um, some Catholic theologians claim that we should leave the Jews alone and we shouldn't try to evangelize the Jews because they all are already in their original saving covenant with God from the Old Testament, so they don't need Christianity because God gave them the promises of the Old Testament and the system of the Old Testament, and he's true to his promises, so, so they don't need Christianity. Now, there are a number of reasons this is ridiculous, and I'll talk a lot more about this tomorrow. One reason being, of course, that Jesus came only to the Jews to evangelize the Jews, and it was to Jews he said things like, unless you're born again of water and the Spirit, you have no life within you, and unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you don't inherit eternal life. Remember, that, was, that line was in the movie, too. Uh, but another reason is that even if God were willing to continue to honor the original covenant with the Jews for their salvation through Judaism, Jews couldn't honor it since 70 AD because they have no temple. And that entire covenant was dependent on animal sacrifice, on purification through blood. And um, there could be no animal sacrifice after the destruction of the temple. So even if God was holding up his end of the bargain, so to speak, the Jews were in no position to hold up their end for the last 1940 years. Um, so let me go back to the mainstream. Um, why, according to Jewish uh, scripture, why was the temple destroyed? And I think this is very telling. The sin for which, um, uh, let me read from the Talmud. Um, but why was the second sanctuary destroyed? The temple at the time of Jesus was known as the second sanctuary because the first was Solomon's. It was built in, um, in the days of Solomon and it was destroyed at the time of the Babylonian exile in 586 BC. And then um, the temple was rebuilt, the second temple, under Herod the Great, and that was the temple that um, we saw in the movie and that was standing at the time of Jesus. Why was the second sanctuary destroyed? Seeing that in its time the Jews were occupying themselves with the Torah, the precepts, and the practice of charity, because there prevailed hatred without cause. Okay, so according to the Talmud, according to the Jewish scriptures, that for the temple was destroyed because of hatred without cause. Does that expression, hatred without cause, sound familiar, maybe from the New Testament? Um, when uh, Jesus at the Last Supper, in John chapter 15, said, quote, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. He who hates me hates my father also. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It is to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> that the Talmud actually confirms in some sense, that the temple, the Jews lost the temple because they crucified Jesus, because of hatred without cause. And um, Jesus uses that very line, hatred without cause, to describe the Jews' hatred of him. When Jesus uses those words, hatred without cause, he is quoting from Psalm 69, which is um, obviously a messianic psalm um, uh, and a portrayal of Jesus' passion. So let me read some verses from Psalm 69. Save me, O God, I am weary with my crying, my throat is dry, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Because for your sake I have borne reproach, shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children, because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. You could not have a more direct prophecy of the passion than that. That's where the line, hatred without cause, uh, is introduced. That is from where Jesus quotes that line, hatred without cause. And then the Talmud turns around and says, the sin of the Jewish people that caused the destruction of the temple.
the state or without cause. Um, Roy, as you just saw in that video, there's, there's a lot of things in there that I think really uh, tie into the connection between, you know, Jesus is discussed or you know, presented in some way in the Talmud. One of the things that you mentioned then is hatred without cause, and that was something to me that really kind of um, really pointed to Jesus. What are your thoughts yeah. on that, or how do you explain well, that? Well, first of all, it's, it's really neat. Um, it's best of both worlds to be a, a, a Jewish Catholic or a Jew in the Catholic Church because there is so much in Judaism that makes sense for the first time um, understanding the Catholic perspective or the fulfillment of Judaism in, in Catholicism and there's so much in Catholicism that makes a whole lot more sense understanding yeah. the Jewish yeah. background sure. to it so everywhere one looks it's just terrific you know all these things spring out in a very exciting way and um, there is a, a mysterious, well, it's not really a mysterious passage in, in the Talmud, but there's a very telling passage in the Talmud. Um, the, the, um, this comes, is written, the Talmud was written down in about the early third century, so it's written down after the destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. And the rabbis in the Talmud are asking, why did God allow the temple to be destroyed? Why was the temple destroyed? What sin? could there have been of the Jewish people, which was so great that God would have the temple destroyed. And so this is now, I'm just reading verbatim from a passage in the Talmud, Yoma 9b. But why was the second temple destroyed? Seeing that during its time, the Jews were occupying themselves with the Torah, the precepts, and the practice of charity, because therein prevailed hatred without cause. So that's a direct quote from the Talmud, hatred without cause. And as Christians, that phrase, hatred without cause, should probably sound familiar because uh, Jesus himself uses it at the Last Supper, at the Last Supper itself, when he says, um, uh, you know, he's explaining, well, anyway, I'll just read the passage. Um, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. He who hates me hates my father also. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It is to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without cause. Right. So, so Jesus himself is describing the, the reason for his rejection and, and persecution being hatred without cause. And the Talmud is turning around and saying that's why the temple was destroyed, because of hatred without cause. Right. And, and that goes back to the Psalms as well. That goes back. This is actually, it's just all so neat because when Jesus says it is to fulfill the word that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause, he's quoting Psalm 69, which is a very graphic picture of the crucifixion. As a matter of fact, it's, the, it's a psalm where they say they gave me gall for my food and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And um, he, it's in there that it describes his persecutors as those who hate me without cause are more than the hairs of my head. Right. You know, you said before one of the first things about <clears throat> when you entered the church that a lot of the Catholics that you met didn't really see the connection with, with Judaism and, and Catholicism. Oops. And um, I can totally, um, totally understand that. One of the things that I always wondered, <clears throat> I think a lot of Christians have this feeling is, you know, after reading some of those things and, and thinking about this, wh why is it so difficult that, 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 you know, more Jewish folks don't see that connection and are, uh, you know, converting to Christianity as well? Uh, I, I think um, uh, because not enough Christians are praying for the conversion of the Jews, not enough Catholics are praying for the conversion of the Jews, because uh, faith is a gift, it's the fruit of grace, and grace from, comes from prayer and offering sacrifices. And if I can wear the other hat, if you go up to somebody who does not already have faith, was not raised Christian or Catholic, never took the story seriously, and start to tell them that um, actually Jesus was God himself because God became a man and um, came out of the womb of a virgin who had never known a man without destroying her virginity afterwards. And when God did become a man, he became a man in order to die the most humiliating, painful death possible. 
you know, what is really easily believable about that? It takes faith. Mm -hmm. It takes faith. I mean, it takes grace. You're not, that's not a story, you know, it's not a story that's, that goes down easily if you, if, if you don't already have it in you. Right. Well, certainly, you know, uh, you know, grace is, is definitely a gift um, that is required. I guess the other thing is, I, you know, one of the things that I know myself, because um, I'm a cradle Catholic, and probably would have thought that the same thing that you had mentioned before until uh, I kind of came back to the church, actually going through the Knights of Columbus uh, process and becoming a knight. Um, you know, I, uh, like I mentioned, I was a cradle Catholic, went to Catholic high school, thought I knew the faith, go through the Knights of Columbus uh, process and realize I knew nothing of significance whatsoever. I think there are a lot of Catholics that are out there it, like that. And um, then I was, a, you know, tried to read everything I possibly could uh, to kind of, uh, you know, learn. And what I found out was, you know, to be, in my opinion, to be Catholic is the greatest gift you can have in this life. And uh, the Catholic Mass is, you know, such a powerful uh, part of that. And, I, and that's another thing when you, when you look at Judaism. There's a lot of elements to the Mass. I mean, when you went to the first Mass, did you see any threads of Judaism in that at all? It's, it's very Jewish. It's extremely Jewish. Um, especially if it's a, in a more old-fashioned kind of physical context. Um, I mean, just look at the church. I mean, if you, if you go to a synagogue, you, you have in the front... It's called the dais. It's not called the altar, but it's a raised, you know, raised area. Um, you have a, a, you know, a table there, which is used for reading the Torah. And dead center, you have the um, Ark of the Covenant. You have the, the Ark where the Torah scrolls are kept. And above it, you have a light, which is supposed to never go out. Um, it already looks like a Catholic church, right, with the tabernacle in the middle and with the light of the, you know, the, the presence there. Um, the, um, the structure of the Jewish synagogue worship service is, um, there are a lot of prayers, but it, it, there's a reading from the prophets, and then there is a reading from the Torah itself, and the, uh, uh, how can I put it, the, the, they're both sacred scripture, but the Torah has a m more elevated role than the prophets does. It's kind of holier. And that structure is the same structure as the epistle reading or the mm -hmm. Old Testament reading followed by the gospel reading, because the gospel is in some sense holier than the, um, you know, than the epistles or than the Old Testament in, in Catholicism. Um, if, a, uh, if a Torah scroll wears out, which it does eventually because it's written on parchment, it is uh, considered, it, it receives a burial like a person does and is buried in the ground, it can't just be disposed of because it's too sacred. What happens to the, a particle of the Eucharist if, the, if a particle of the Eucharist has to be disposed of? It's buried. Mm -hmm. It has to go into the ground. It can't just be thrown out because mm -hmm. it's too sacred. Um, the, I mean, uh, very much in Judaism, uh, and especially the Jewish liturgy, is a precursor to its fulfillment in Catholicism, and is a kind of mirror image in advance, a kind of shadow image in advance, with the same structure as the eventual fulfillment in, in the ultimate reality of, of um, the fulfillment of the promise of Judaism, which mm -hmm. is the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Well, Roy, the third and final clip that we have in this segment is a clip from Dr. Uh, Brant Petrie. And he does a series, and I think he's very well known for this, is the Jewish roots. He had Jewish roots of Eucharist, Jewish roots of the Mass, Jewish roots of um, the Papacy. We're going to show a clip from the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. And in that, he's using their, the first Christians' understanding, they were all Jews, their understanding of Judaism, how that led them to understand the Eucharist. And there's three keys that he talks about, the Passover, the manna, and um, the bread of the presence. So let's take a look at that, and then we're going to come back and have a, a few more questions for you. And what we're going to look at in particular tonight are three key images from ancient Jewish practice and belief. Three key images from the Jewish Bible that shed light on the mystery of the Eucharist. And those are, number one, the Jewish Passover. Number two, the Jewish beliefs about the manna from heaven. And then number three, the mysterious 
Jewish bread of the presence, which is kind of my favorite, the mysterious bread of the presence that the Jews kept in the tabernacle of Moses and then later in the temple of Solomon. And what we're going to see is when you look at their Jewish hopes for what the Messiah would do connected with those three things, the Passover, the manna, and the bread of the presence, we're going to see how it was their Jewish faith that led them to their Catholic faith in their real presence. Okay? That's our goal for tonight. Now, in order to do that, we need to back up, though, and take a little remedial lesson in ancient Jewish faith and ancient Jewish beliefs about the Messiah. So if you look at the top of your handout here, the first section is entitled The New Exodus. Let's begin there. In order to understand the Jewish Christian belief in the Eucharist, we first have to understand the Jewish hopes that were alive and well in the first century AD. Now, if you ask most Christians today, what the Jewish people in the first century AD, at the time of Christ, were waiting for when it came to the Messiah, you'll probably hear an answer something like this. This is what most people think. In the first century, at the time of Christ, the Jews were waiting for an earthly political Messiah to set them free from the Roman Empire. Anybody heard that before? Is that Okay, a few of you have. It's a pretty common idea among most Christians. If you know anything about ancient Judaism, you probably know that most Jews were waiting for an earthly political Messiah. You may have seen that on documentaries or television shows or reenactments of the life of Christ. Now, that's partly true. There is some truth to that. There were some Jews who were waiting for an earthly political Messiah, like the Zealots, who were waiting for a military revolution and a military Messiah. But most Jews, common Jews, Jews who knew the Old Testament, were actually waiting for something much, much more. If you had to boil down their hopes about the Messiah to one thing, to one overarching hope, I would suggest to you that it is this. The Jews at the time of Christ were waiting for a new exodus. A new exodus. According to the prophets of the Old Testament, God, when the Messiah came, would save his people in much the same way as he had saved them at the time of Moses and the exodus from Egypt. If you read through the prophets of the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all the prophets we know and hear about in the Mass, what you're going to find is over and over again, they're going to talk about the fact that when God sends the Messiah, he's going to reenact, recapitulate, or recap the events of the first exodus from Egypt so that this new era, the age of the salvation of the Messiah, would be a kind of new exodus. If you look at your handout here, I'll give you some parallels between these two exodus to shed light on this, give you a few more details. Roy, there's, there's one thing in, in, uh, that Dr. Petrie mentions that I think really stood out to me uh, as a Catholic in, in looking at this and that connection is that whole sense of remembrance. You know, I, I think, um, you know, zikor or zikaron actually is a word that you often see is kind of connected with that. But the idea that as um, Jews celebrate the Passover Seder, they are actually made present and participate in the first exodus. Um, that's a strong, a strong concept to me because in the, the Catholic Mass it's the same concept that, uh, you know, we're actually participating in the, in the um, Last Supper and, and Passion of Christ as well. Uh, what did that mean to you? I mean, do you see that connection? In yeah, the, 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 the um, Passover meal, it's called the Passover Seder, has a kind of a script that is to be read, it's, it's, it's the instructions for the liturgy, basically, and the various um, people who are present at the Seder take turns reading, um, and so it's, it's pretty formulaic. And in that uh, formulaic reading, there is very explicitly brought forth the a teaching that when a Jew participates in the Passover Seder, he is not to view the retelling of the story of Exodus, of the freeing of the Jews from slavery in Egypt, as though it was just a story being told, but in participating in the Passover Seder, it is making the participants present at the Exodus and making them recipients of the grace of the Exodus by, uh, as though they were present there. And so it's very parallel to the fulfillment in the Catholic Church, which is that when we are at Mass, it's not just a reenactment of uh, Jesus at the Last Supper and at Calvary, dying on the cross, but we are being made present each time we're at Mass. It's a very, very similar concept. Right, right, right. Well, you know, uh, Roy, that really um, 
kind of wraps up our, our first segment that we wanted to talk about, which is the connection between Judaism and Catholicism. And uh, the next segment that we're going to be talking about is actually kind of going back to your witness testimony and talk about a little bit, you know, some of those um, uh, experience that you had, your kind of where you were at as far as personally um, in your experience. And uh, you mentioned something in there about uh, scientific, your background at MIT and so forth, and the pseudoscientific uh, kind of worldview that it had and how that impacted your faith. But I want to thank you a lot for taking the time to talk to this, uh, with us about the Judaism and Catholicism. Hopefully it helps a lot of the folks. Well, that thanks about. for the opportunity. Thanks for watching. Oh, oh, oh.